Welcome to St. Joseph Evangelization Network. I'm your host today, Peter Karutz, and we are going to be talking about how to make a moral decision the Catholic way with Father Brian Harrison. Nice to be with you again, Peter. We've done a couple of programs before, and it's great to be back with St. Joseph Radio. Thank you, Father, and I'm, I'm so glad that you uh, actually came up with this idea. It, it's uh, relevant and timely and, frankly, I think forgotten. You know, we as Catholics need to make decisions, just like everyone else, but we have a little extra help. Yeah. The, uh, the reason this topic came up in our mind is because here in Missouri particularly, and at a wider level also, just this week there's coming up a couple of issues, one from the past, one from the present, that involve serious moral reflection on the part of Catholics. One, the, the more wider issue is that this Thursday, uh, August 6th, is going to be the 75th anniversary of the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. All right. And of course, that's the anniversary is coming up. There's a lot of discussion renewed again. Well, now it's a terrible thing, the beginning of the nuclear warfare age. And you know, was that bomb justified, the end of World War II? Uh, so it's, it's a debatable issue that's been coming up. And Catholics have had very different opinions about that. Uh, so that's a general issue. And the other one that's coming up immediately here in the state of Missouri, this coming Tuesday, August the 4th, is a vote along with the primaries that we've got for different candidates. But apart from that, there's a very important ethical issue coming up that's Amendment 2 proposed for the Missouri State Con uh, uh, constitution, which is whether to expand Medicaid services in this state. Many states have done so already, quite a few have not, and there are ethical arguments for and against that. We've seen different Catholics coming up with different opinions about that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, this might be a good topic to talk about, not to really to emphasize so much or get into the pros and cons of those specific issues, though we can perhaps do that briefly. Uh, but I thought this would be a good occasion to reflect about what kind of thinking Catholics should engage in, what kind of premises and questions should we ask as a method for resolving difficult moral questions. Excellent. Um, yeah. It's a kind of thing that I've had a lot of experience with because I'm a former, I'm retired now, I was a professor of moral theology in the Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico years ah, ago. is that right? And um, teaching seminary future priests about these difficult issues. So it's something that I had, I've had quite a lot of experience with. And just in recent, uh, last week or so, a couple of these issues have come up with some of my friends and parishioners. And it's evident that really there's a lot of confusion in this area about how to go about solving difficult, debatable, ethical questions. I, well, then I, I didn't know that, but uh, you, I don't know if you're familiar with an ethicist. Uh, he's a religious, uh, he's a priest, but he's a religious. I think his name is uh, Father Tad Paholchek. Uh, he, I hear, I, I've started reading a little bit about him, but what I find interesting in, in his uh, commentary is uh, twofold. One, he really goes toward Catholic teaching in order to guide us into making a d good decision. But the next thing he says, or I should say the first thing he says, is that we really need to inform ourselves. Just like we inform our conscience about um, um, moral issues, we have to f inform our intellect about um, uh, all issues, really. And we are not capable of making a decision unless we are informed. Yeah. Oh. Unless we are informed. Yeah. So uh, I, I gave up watching the news a lot uh, long ago, and I watched C-SPAN because I'm tired of people telling me what I heard and how I should think. Yeah. I'd rather make those decisions myself. But as you said, Father, I mean, one of the things we're going to be voting on, uh, on the surface, might seem very, very good, and why not, right? But uh, when you get into it a little bit, there's, there's other thorny issues. And, yeah. you know, sometimes... One of the main things might be that why are we having a, an, a, an amendment to the Constitution rather than just a vote? There's, there's, there's a reason for it. 
and we need to rather, reinform. Rather than the legislative process. Yeah. Which is the normal process, not the extraordinary process. Yes, once something's in the Constitution, it's kind of set in stone, and that, uh, Absolutely. that, that makes it um, uh, a little bit more firmly, well, quite a bit more firmly entrenched than simply uh, legislation. Absolutely. So um, what, should we, what should we be considering? When we talk, well, when we think the, about this the, uh, issue, for example. I'd like to refer viewers and listeners, especially to, there's a section of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which sums up this whole issue of procedures for making difficult moral decisions mm -hmm. very well. It's in the section entitled, The Morality of Human Acts. Now, Every educated Catholic really should have a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Probably a lot of viewers already do. And this is, begins in, in number 1750, 1750 of the, uh, uh, the Catechism. And again, this is not about specific good and bad actions. It's about evaluating the morality of moral acts. What factors make an act moral or immoral? What kind of questions do we ask in order to reach a decision about difficult questions? So the Catechism begins this section, number 1750, uh, listing what are called the sources of morality. And there are basically three sources of morality in our Catholic moral theology. And for any moral decision to be morally acceptable, all these three factors have to be verified. Mm. If just one of them is wrong, it's a no-no. It's an action that really can't be justified. Yeah. And the three uh, elements that are mentioned here, and I'll go through them one by one, and we can talk about each of them in succession. First of all, the object of your action. That's the thing. It's the, basically, this is the answer to the question, what are you doing? That has to be something that's good in itself, or at least maybe morally neutral. There's lots of things like um, chocolate or vanilla. E eating, or, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, eating something, going to sleep. There's a lot of things we do every day in themselves are morally neutral. Well, the first condition is that what we're planning on doing has to be either good, actually virtuous, or at least nothing wrong with it in itself. It's a uh, either good or morally neutral kind of action. That's the first condition. That's what's called in theology the object, the, the, the direct, immediate thing that you're doing. Not to be confused with the word objective. Right. The objective of something, often we take that to mean the purpose or intention. Yeah. Now that's the second condition. Uh -huh. uh, the object in this sense of the immediate thing that you're doing has to be good, or at least not bad, then the second condition is you have to do it with a good intention. Uh, now there's plenty of things we can think of <clears throat> that might be perfectly good or acceptable in themselves, but the intention could certainly make it bad. Mm -hmm. right. Let's think, for example, of a guy who picks up a girl on the highway hitching a ride. Right. Pick up, give someone a ride, well that's in its, just thinking of going that far, that's nothing wrong with that. But if his intention is to take her to a secluded place and rape her, well, that's going to make it supremely bad, right? So Absolutely. that would be a question of doing something where the, the first condition is fulfilled, pick up someone, give them a ride, sure, why not? But the intention was going to make that one bad. Yeah. And right from the beginning, the guy who opens that door gets the girl in there. It's a bad act because his intention is bad. And intention is so important. And, and I think that... Uh, our legal and just judici judicial system has been very much in influenced with that as well, mens rea, right? In order to commit a crime, you must have the intent to, you must have the, yeah. it, it seems like it flows right from Catholic theology. Well, yes, or, or even going further back than Catholic theology, we get back to the natural, going back to like to Aristotle and sure. uh, there's a whole tradition of natural law that our Catholic philosophers and theologians coming from St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, as part of what's called the perennial philosophy, the philosophy of perennis. There's a, 
whole tradition of wisdom going back to the Greeks, which our Christian, great the, uh, Christian theologians and doctors built on and developed. And we have the supreme example of that, of course, in the theology and uh, philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Um, so the, the, we the, have to have an object that is an good. An object is good. We have to the have intention an intention. The has to be yeah. good. Now, the third condition, this is where the more difficult questions usually arrive. The object answers the question, what are you doing or proposing to do? The intention answers the question, why are you doing it? And the third one is the circumstances have to be appropriate. It might, you might, it might be a good thing in itself. You might mean well, have a good intention. But in certain circumstances, this is like the, the how, the when, and um, what means that those kind of questions have to be asked. And even if the first two conditions are fulfilled, maybe the act is going to be wrong because the circumstances are inappropriate. Let's say, for instance, that you're, uh, just a simple example, you're dressed for the beach with very light summer clothing, maybe a swimsuit. Okay. In itself, it's not bad as long as it's a reasonably modest swimsuit. And your intention, well, it's summer weather, keep cool. Yeah. But let's say it's in church. Circumstances, that's not the place you wear a swimsuit. No matter how hot the weather. <laughs> Irrespective so, of your intention, it's okay. probably not so good. So it's, 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 a, it's a wrong, morally wrong act to show up to church in a swimsuit. It's right. not the right place. Right. Um, we can think of ex a whole lot of examples. Um, St. Francis de Sales in his famous work, The Introduction to D Devout Life, talks about how different styles of devotion and piety have to be adapted to different vocations. Mm -hmm. And he says, for instance, that um, uh, someone who's praying six hours a day, if you're a monk or a nun, well, fine. But if you're a housewife with a busy schedule, children to look after, meals to cook and so on, if you spend six hours a day praying when you are, you're neglecting household duties and looking after the children, well, okay, what you're doing is just fine, praying. What your intention is, I want to please God. I want to expose Good. it just fine. But the circumstances, right? The circumstances. Uh, if, if you're a busy, you're not your vocation as a housewife or a or a businessman or a teacher or a doctor, whatever it is. If it's not that of a monk, particularly in, let's say a, a hermit and closed monk then you can't be praying all day, no matter, no matter how good that is, and so, because the circumstances are not appropriate for your situation. Sure, and in that circumstance, the, the changing of diapers might be considered a prayer. Well, yeah. Because that is what God has called you to do. So if you're doing what God has called you to do, that is your circumstance. Well, that, that was the, that's the famous labora et ora principle of St. Benedict, the, the founder of the monastic life. Pray and work. Those right. are the two keystones or of work uh, and pray. The mat, work and pray. Or pray and work. And uh, uh, prayer can be can, can be considered your work, your your opus, what you, what you were doing in your particular state of life. But of course, working out in the fields, as the Benedictines have always done, that can be offered up as a prayer to God sure. as well. So it's their circumstance. That's right. And it's the mother's circumstance uh, that's different as well. That's clear. So the, the, uh, these are the three basic questions that has to be asked when we're evaluating uh, a moral question. Sometimes the answer to moral questions is very clear right from the word go in the moral doctrine of the church. Is it okay to have an abortion, directly kill the innocent? No, that's, you know, it's, it's bad in itself. But very often, perhaps more often than not, the questions we face in real life uh, might not have such an obvious answer, even if we're Catholics and we know the basic doctrine of the church. But lots of Catholics don't have this procedure clearly in their minds. Look at the object, the intention, and the circumstances. I might go further than that, Father. I, I would say that some Catholics unfortunately, 
won't even go to the point of considering it. It's almost a dismissal. This is what yeah. I think. And there's a dismissal. And we do have an obligation to not only inform our conscience, but to be understanding of how to make a good and moral decision. That's right. There's, there's, there's far too much of what, what we hear about so-called cafeteria Catholicism. Sure. Many professing Catholics who don't even, not even interested in what the church teaches. And we've got Catholic politicians who can be some of the world's worst in promoting abortion. They call themselves Catholics, promoting same-sex relationships. We see this thing all over the place now. And of course, that sets a bad example for when it's leaders in society who do this and they're called Catholics and they're allowed to receive communion just like nothing has happened. This filters down to a very bad effect. It sends out the message that the church doesn't really believe too strongly in its own teaching if it just goes along with this kind of thing in Comes our leaders. If leaders can do it, why not me? Yeah. So we have this, uh, uh, this generalized weakness which is becoming, I think, more marked all the time now because uh, that kind of thing is supported by the mass media and mm -hmm. we're, as we're seeing and an increasing climate of uh, rejection of a lot of traditional Catholic and Christian moral norms. And the mass media is exerting influence as well. Father, I, I do a lot of uh, expert testimony in court and um, sometimes the telltale sign of a question that is going to be very damaging is, wouldn't you agree with me, right? Or doesn't this sound reasonable? And so often, and you mentioned the mass media, the mass mm. media present things in such a, uh, more than benign, yeah. but in a virtuous fashion, yeah. that yeah. your normal inclination is to say, oh wow, that sounds great. But as in the law or in, in important issues, you've got to dig deeper and understand the underlying circumstances. Yeah. So uh, th these are the basic three questions we have to ask. <clears throat> we can maybe go on to have a, a brief look at some of these, th these um, very controversial issues that have come, ag come up again recently. But there's the thing about the 75th anniversary of the bomb and the... Uh, uh, here in Missouri, this upcoming amendment about whether to ex expand Medicaid in this state. Pope Francis actually had a statement the other day. It's in this week's St. Louis Review, our Missouri uh, St. Louis Catholic newspaper reported there that he said, yes, it's coming up to the 75th anniversary of the atomic bomb and these weapons of mass destruction are a terrible evil. And I think he quoted or at least referred to what Vatican Council II had to say about this. Uh, this was a, such a very difficult issue because, of course, the atom bomb ended World War II. Historians continue to debate the original idea was, well, you know, a la the alternative, a land invasion of Japan would have cost hundreds of thousands of American lives. There's debate about that now, whether that really would have had to be necessary. Uh, there are historians saying, well, the Japanese were on the brink of surrender anyway. And, uh, but quite apart from the, the question of just how many lives are lost with this or that option, uh, Vatican II, just less than just exactly 20 years after the bombs were dropped in 1965 in the last document signed by the Council Fathers by Pope Paul VI. And all the American bishops signed on this too, mm, or perhaps, perhaps one or two exceptions. But the, I think these are the strongest words in the whole of the Council's teachings. Vatican Council II, as is well known, was deliberately a so-called pastoral council. Mm -hmm. The idea being not to issue harsh condemnations and censures, but to reach out to build a bridge to today's world. Uh, and so most of the things they said were, let's say, benign in character. But this passage here from the Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Space, number 80, there's a section here about total warfare. And 
Is it worth just, a read? Just, just, just this passage here I'll read yeah. briefly. The Council endorsing the condemnations of total warfare issued by recent popes, and there's a footnote there quoting Pope John the Twenty-Third, Pius the Twelfth, and Paul the Sixth about this. Endorsing these condemnations, the Council declares every act of war, and it doesn't say just some or some of it's done by the Nazis or the Communists or not the American, it just says every act of war directed to the indiscriminate destruction of whole cities or vast areas with their inhabitants is a crime against God and man which merits firm and unequivocal condemnation." End of quote. So uh, that's, that's a pretty direct and blunt passage. And um, basically it's simply applying one of the three conditions we've been talking mm -hmm. about, that the object ha of, of something, of a moral decision or a moral choice, has to be something good. And if it's not, that you don't even have to consider steps two and three. It's ruled out from the word go. And direct killing of the innocent is one of those things. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens with the mass destruction. Not only Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but we can think of um, there was fire bombing of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. the, the Nazis fire bombed London. The Allies at the end of the world were, war were fire bombing. Horrible deaths inflicted by burning to death and baking beneath the streets of Dresden, Leipzig, some of those cities. Uh, these are horrible actions. And really, we have to say with hindsight, even though at the time there was so much emotion involved in these things, and we've got to, we've got to win that war, cost what may. But looking at, at it like with years of hindsight and more calmly and objectively, I believe you have to say, well, look, you know, direct killing of the innocent like that, of women, children, uh, old men, women, children, unborn children. I mean, there were plenty of pregnant women killed in those things too. We can't justify that. And once we do, we're opening the war for uh, opening the door for uh, it undermines completely our teaching against uh, abortion, for instance. Mm -hmm. If you say you can kill, directly kill the innocent in one situation to achieve a good end or to save more lives, you're getting into the principle that the end justifies the means or a, a good purpose or intention justifies whatever means. Uh, and that's just not a Catholic principle. In fact, St. Paul uh, says in the scriptures that uh, you cannot do evil that good may come. So right. that's, that's the theological basis of this first condition that we've been talking about. The object, the direct, uh, what you are doing in itself has to be morally good, otherwise the best intentions in the world, the best circumstances, the best consequences cannot justify it. The, the, the theory or the, what we learned as children that the ends do not justify the means um, are exactly what you're describing here. But when we put certain circumstances to it, it becomes more difficult to accept perhaps, but, but yeah. if you break it down to its, as you say, the three components, it becomes very, very clear. All the personal involvement and the emotion and whatnot tends to drift away. Yeah, Father, is, is there also a, a, de a degree of participation that's to be considered? In other words, direct, indirect, and... Uh, yes, well, we'll come to back the, the, in a minute. There's, yeah. uh, there's a famous uh, Catholic moral principle called the principle of double effect. Of course. Yeah. And we can come back to that in a minute. Let's just um, say a little bit more about, let's look at, look at the, the, the other big issue that we mentioned that's coming up uh, very shortly for Missouri voters, the expansion of Medicaid. Now, um, the Missouri Catholic Conference has issued a set of got they are recommending a yes vote on this and Missouri right to life is recommending the opposite they're recommending a no vote and I'm not going to get into the I mean this is the sort of thing that uh, Catholics need to ref, uh, 
decide responsibly for themselves, but just to sort of lay out the, the pros and cons here, why are some Catholics saying that it's okay and others not? First of all, even though it's, it's our bishops who are recommending a yes vote on this, but this is not magisterium, this is a prudential judgment, it's not clear-cut doctrine of the church that, that we're obliged to follow. It's Maybe kind of, we'll pause on that. And, yeah. um, um, I think the director, uh, uh, Mr. Rupp, actually came out Steve with Rupp, a, yes. Steve Rupp with a very clear and concise, but you used the word, and I, and I think it's important maybe to describe that a little bit. You said it's a prudential judgment, yeah. and I, I think many people confuse prudential and, and, and moral, but what do you mean by prudential, Father? Well, a number of questions where there's no clear-cut, obvious yes or no answer to a decision we're going to make have to be based on the virtue of prudence. Now, that's now Catholic tradition and the great perennial philosophy tradition of natural law also going right back to Aristotle and Plato. Uh, prudence is one of the so-called cardinal virtues. Mm -hmm. It's the virtue by which it sort of kind of guides the other main virtues. There was the famous image in Plato of a, a charioteer with various horses and the horses, the other cardinal virtues are courage temperance, that's controlling our appetites, and justice. But controlling it, driving the chariot, is prudence. Prudence is the virtue that enables us to, to look into all the different relevant factors that, that are coming into a situation, evaluate them wisely, and come to the, the best decision based on available evidence, which can require things like consultation with other people, it can require things like foresight, trying to evaluate uh, the pros and cons, the different consequences. So it's the virtue of practical wisdom, mm. as distinct from just sort of theoretical. You might have a guy who's got all the PhDs in the world and he's a, a brilliant math brain or something like that, but uh, he, his life might be a mess because he doesn't have the virtue of prudence. Right. And in all of and, this that we're describing in this issue in the Missouri, Due consideration is, yeah. is part of that prudence. Yeah, prud prudential judgments are distinct from doctrinal judgments. Mm. Again, the church has clear moral teachings about uh, that are kind of things that are always wrong or things that we're always obliged to do. But so very often with these difficult decisions, they're debatable. Good Catholics can legitimately have different opinions sure. on some of these. And when the bishops issue a statement, that's guidance that we have to take very seriously and respectfully, but it doesn't command our assent in the same way as that a clear-cut doctrine of the church does. There we are, so, Pru so prudence and prudential. That's right. There can be a debate. That's right. So in this case that we're facing in Missouri here next Tuesday, um, this is a, a very important case in point. Now, <clears throat> just to summarize the, the case for the expansion of Medicaid, uh, those who favor this say, well, it's going to make available health care for many needy Missourians who haven't been able to get it until now. A great many other states, I think the, the federal government is offering this Medicaid expansion. And a lot of states have taken it, quite a few states have not. So the decision's coming up here. But the, the main argument for is, well, there are lots of very poor folks out there and sometimes they have to choose between bread on their table and medicine they need and so on, they, because they, can't, they have, don't have health insurance, they don't qualify it at present in this state, and it causes great hardship for them. So this um, uh, Medicaid expansion proposed will be very helpful for them, and uh, any unintended but foreseeable bad consequences, which we'll come to in a minute, they would say, well, that, that's sort of outweighed by this primary good that we're seeking there. Um, now, the Missouri right to life position, well, let's, let's analyze that, first of all, from the, from the point of view of these three conditions we've been talking right. about. Good point. First of all, the object chosen. Now, the, that's the, the, the direct primary thing that you are voting for. In this case, 
there's no problem because if we just consider helping poor and needy folks, if we just consider that by itself in abstraction without going into the other things, sure, it's a part of the gospel sure. to help the poor and needy. So there's clearly what the, those who favor a yes vote for the amendment, they're definitely complying with the first condition for evaluating the morality of, of, a, of, a, of a decision. What's being asked to do here is to give greater economic assistance to, to poor and needy folks in this state who are often very in a difficult situation facing the choice of hunger or sickness. So yeah, in itself, that is uh, certainly a good object. And I'd say also those who advocate, uh, as our bishops are doing, uh, a yes vote on this amendment. The intention, that's the second condition, that's also perfectly in order because the intention is charity to help those in need. It's a, uh, a decision that's in itself just considered the first step, helping the poor, sure. The intention, yes, because this is part of our duty of Christian charity. Uh, it's fulfilling the gospel. The Lord himself speaks so many times about the importance of in that famous parable of the sheep and the goats, right? Sure. Eternal salvation can depend on whether you've been willing to help the poor and needy. So <clears throat> the first two conditions, I'd say, are certainly fulfilled by those who advocate a yes vote on Amendment 2. I would say for some of the people. Oh, that... well, yeah, uh, yeah, you, you're right, because uh, this amendment, of course, is being very strongly supported by Planned Parenthood and NARAL. Exactly. And their intentions, well, let's... Uh, we'll leave them aside not judge, for a but, but <laughs> it's very questionable whether they are good intentions from the point of view of Catholic uh, principles because they want more money to carry out all kinds of things, uh, including abortions. And uh, obviously that's, that we, kind of intention is not good from a Catholic. I think it's very fair to assume that the bishop's intentions are, Absolutely. are good. Absolutely. No, 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 no question about no it. No question. So that leaves us with evaluating the third uh, factor there, the circumstances. Now, this is where the, the difficulty comes, and this is where the debatable part comes, because all sides are agreed, well, yes, there are some negative things we can see in this economic. I think it's the head of the Missouri House Budget Committee or something came out with a statement saying, look, this is going to be tremendously expensive for us. The state can't afford it, even though you know, we're getting some federal money, but there's other going to be other expenses. <clears throat> In order well, to garner that federal money, $300 million, yeah. the state has to come up with an equal amount. Yeah. And, and last year, the budget wasn't, uh, had difficulty being balanced. So there is an so economic he's saying, effect. There's an eco he's saying that those who oppose the amendment say, well, look, uh, Yes, there's some benefits there, but we're going to have to, d to take away from other very important programs mm -hmm. to fulfill the needs for here. And we don't think this is an expense that we can afford. So that's an economic argument. Now, coming to the, uh, the Pacific, specific, you mentioned Steve Rupp of uh, Missouri, right, Missouri Right to Life. And he and, and other MRL leaders have come out pointing out that another one of the effects of this is going to be a great expansion, part of the package deal here. Certainly in abortive fashions being paid for by taxpayer money, uh, the RU, whatever it is, 480 something, uh, morning you, after pill, mm -hmm. and more, and yeah. even the regular contraceptive pill mm -hmm. often acts as an abortive fashion. We know that now. That's right. And, uh, but not only that, they're pointing out that uh, if the Hyde Amendment is overturned in Congress, which is if, if the Democrats win in November, that's a certainty because even Joe Biden, who, who upheld the amendment for many, many years, has flip flipped on that. And all the Democrats are now saying the Hyde Amendment, for those who may not be aware of that, is the provision that that prevents federal tax pay, taxpayers money from being spent on abortions. And we've heard about the Hyde Amendment for many, many years, but one thing that we should recognize is that this is not a law that is carried on year in, year in and year out. 
it is an amendment that's renewed every time there is a federal appropriations bill. Right, yeah. So it's it, 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 how how long does it take to eliminate it? Just like that, right? It could be right. Gone. So the uh, the concern there is that of uh, a yes vote on amendment two. Even though yes, it'll it'll bring welcome relief to poor Missourians who need health insurance, but one of these side effects that's inevitable goes with it is that great expansion certainly in abortive fashions and very possibly in surgical abortions paid for by taxpayer money if the Hyde Amendment is overturned. Well now, um, so Missouri Right to Life's position is that given, given these circumstances, the package deal, looking at the pro, this is where you have to weigh, weigh the pros and cons, when the act itself is okay, the intention is good, you still have to consider this third uh, fact of the circumstances. And the circumstances involved in helping the poor with Medicaid expansion, if you follow the Missouri right to life position, is that they, the bad factors outweigh the positive because of all this expansion in intrinsically evil acts of taking, directly taking the life of uh, unborn innocence. Now this brings us to the, uh, the other question that we brought up a while ago. How do we decide, if we, if we can see, well yes there are bad effects and good effects, let's, so, let's suppose that we're all agreed that they're undesirable effects. Now certainly, clearly, those who fav the, the Missouri bishops and those Catholics who favor a yes vote agree with Missouri right to life that yes, side effects or, or part of the package deal that involves uh, more direct taking of human life by abortive fashions, everyone's agree, well that, yeah, that's, that's, that's a bad effect. No one's saying that's good. Of course, the Planned Parenthood and Co. The NRL, they'll say it's, that's great. Catholics, Orthodox Catholics are agree that that's bad. But the question is, how do we decide whether that bad effect outweighs the good effect, which is what we're trying to achieve with the a yes vote? Well, this brings us to this um, principle we mentioned before. There's an important principle in Catholic moral theology that goes hand in hand together with the th these three steps we've been considering, the object, the end or intention, and the circumstances. And this helps to flesh out the last of those, the circumstances, to analyze the circumstances. Now this is a principle which is traditionally called uh, the principle of double effect. Mm -hmm. And what that means is this, suppose you're evaluating an action and you can foresee that it has two effects. Let's take a simple case first of all, because it can get more complicated. But a simple case, a bad effect and a good effect. Now the question is, how do I decide whether I can go ahead with that act? If I know it has a good effect, but it's going to have a bad effect. Well the principle of double effect, basically it involves four steps. Some of them coincide with what we've already talked about with the object and circumstances. First of all, the act itself has to be good. We've covered that already. In this case, okay, yes, what we are doing is voting for an increase in assistance to the poor and needy folks. Okay. The second condition is again the same what we've covered already. It has to be a good intention. Now the third condition that we can do something that has this bad effect is that it can't itself, sorry, the good effect can't be the direct result of the bad effect. Right. Because if we do that, we're getting back into the, the question of um, doing evil that good may come. Perhaps we can give an example of that in a minute. Yeah. But The fourth condition is that the, 
the bad effect can't be so bad that it really outweighs the good effect. Now, the classic example that's, you know, that seminarians learn about in moral theology, and we can give an example here, is a case where the principle of double effect allows for the, um, the bad effect to be carried out. It's the case of a woman, let's say she's pregnant with a cancerous womb. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, can her womb be removed to save her life, even though this will inevitably kill the unborn child that she's carrying at that time? So analyzing that question, which is a relatively simple one, from the point of view of this principle of double effect, what we are doing, the thing in itself, the surgical operation of extracting a cancerous womb, is in itself morally unobjectionable. In fact, it's a, a good act necessary for the health of the mother's life. That's what you're doing to exercise that it's going to be, let's say they're not directly touching the baby, but they're, they're taking mm -hmm. the, the mother's womb out. The baby's in there. Okay. Second principle is the intention good. Yes, the purpose of saving a life is a good intention. Third principle, we know the, the bad effect is the baby's going to die. Is that, is the good effect the result of the bad effect or not? No, it's not. No. So that could be because it, it's the other way around here. The bad effect comes as a side effect of the, the good effect. Right. The good effect is taking out the, the cancerous womb that's threatening the th life of the mother. And as a result of that, shortly after that, the baby there is going to die. Right. It would be different if uh, the baby has to be killed first in order to save the mother. That's not what's happening Absolutely. in this case. Yeah. So that the condition is being fulfilled. And then finally, the fourth question, uh, does the bad effect outweigh the good effect? Because, well, well no, it doesn't, because in, uh, in both cases, in this case, it's an, an, e an equal, it's, it's one life lost and one life saved. The baby's life is lost. The mother's life is saved. So we can't say that the bad effect outweighs the good effect. In this case, or two lost, two, two lives lost. Two lo uh, uh, the, uh, the alternative would be two lives lost, yes. So this is a clear example of where the principle of double effect allows us to carry out that action. Father, as a man who hasn't gone to the major seminaries, uh, I, I look at it in this fashion. The first two uh, points are really paramount. What is my intent? What is the object and what is my intent? In, your cir in the circumstance you're describing, the object is the cancer, the intent is a cure, and the double well, effect. Well, well, well the, the, the object is, is not the cancer. Let's not confuse object with objective. The object is the answer to the question, what are you doing? And what you are doing in this, what the doctor is doing in this removing case, is removing a cancerous womb. Right. That's good in itself. Yep. And the purpose of good, because saving a life, that's good too. So, um, and then analyzing the, weighing the good effect and bad effect, the bad effect does not outweigh the good effect. In fact, if you don't do that, two lives are going to be yeah. lost. But it's unintended. And that's, uh, that, that's, very, that's, unintended. Very, that's very important too. The, uh, with the double effect, the bad effect that you can foresee is going to happen must be undesired and in fact... And unwilled. Unwilled, that's right. That's very important because it would be, even though... Externally, it might be okay, but if your if your uh, secret thing is I don't want this child to be born because let's say that uh, I don't want this uh, some other side effect to happen. I would I hate that. I don't want to see that uh, child born for some other. That would be um, that would make the the action immoral on the part of those doing it, the mother and the doctor, if there's some other bad intention there, mm -hmm. wanting to get rid of that unborn right. baby. But let, supposing that's not the case, then 
uh, there's no problem there. And the, no. I think the problem here, as it comes into the, uh, if I may, in, into the uh, the bill, if you will, is let's let's carry this forward. You know that uh, even where there are laws that are a little bit nebulous, where the abortions are not allowed, except when the life of the mother is at risk. I'm going to change those words, Father. I'm going to say, except when the life or health, and and that's the slippery slope. Health could be, I'm not feeling well. I have a, I'm, I'm distraught, right? And all of a sudden, you can bring federal dollars into it because it's the life or the health, and the health is undefined. Yeah, that's that's the case with then if, all, all our... And then the intent, of course, there yeah. is... Is a, there's a bad intent. There isn't a secondary intent. The primary intent is to eliminate the child. Yeah. And 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 the the, the and 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 the, uh, the the law is just a a means to get it done. Yeah. So those are basically the issues. As I say, I think it's up to every Catholic to decide, every voter in Missouri to decide. Uh, you know, vote yes or no. The, the summing up the. The argument for yes vote is it's going to have a, uh, a great effect in helping poor Missourians getting health insurance that they can't afford now. And uh, the argument is that uh, this is the only way of getting that done because if you try to pursue that aim through the legislative process, then um, it's very uncertain. Be long, these people would go a long time without that if, if at all. And so this is really the only practical way we can see this and it's worth the economic costs and yes it's undesirable that there's going to be some uh, uh, a, a, an increase in the number of, a, of at least of, at least a board of fashions and possibly but they they're saying well you can you can fight that in other ways the abortions and work for that in as a separate thing so th these are the arguments for a yes vote and the arguments for a no vote are well uh, yes, it's going to help uh, the intentions good. What you're doing is voting for the um, more poor Missourians to have health insurance who are really struggling and suffering. And it's true. I, I have people on knocking on my door as a priest and they're, sure. they're really in great difficulties with little children to feed and medicine. And We can see that there are definitely pluses there. But the question is whether this is outweighed by the, uh, um, for, from a Catholic point of view, the increase in uh, taxpayer-funded deaths by a board of fashions and possibly even surgical abortions if the Hyde Amendment's overturned. And then uh, economic side effects too. But these are the kind of issues that have to be weighed and what we've been, I think we're probably coming to the end of our time. We have about five minutes. Five. Yeah. So what we're, what we're trying to do in this, this talk this afternoon is look at the, uh, without trying to resolve definitively one on that particular issue of the yes or no vote on Amendment 2, but the kind of principles and mental, moral reasoning that, we sh that Catholics should carry out in order to evaluate these questions asking that, let's just summarize once again, uh, three factors go into the mix here. Object, namely what you are doing. Intention, why you are doing it. And number three, circumstances. What are the different effects, side effects uh, that have to be weighed, even if the first two conditions are fulfilled? That's where the difficulty comes. That's where good Catholics can reasonably disagree about a lot of questions. And that's where um, prudential judgment comes in. Another classic example of this kind of thing is whether a particular war is just or not. Mm, just war uh, the, theory. The, the, yeah. same, the same kind of evaluation has to come in, looking at the foreseeable consequences even if the intention is good, even if there's a really bad, you know, a, a cause for such and such a war, there's been some terrible injustice, let's say, they have to think, well, after all the other peaceful re uh, attempts at resolving the sit uh, dispute being, uh, being uh, have, have they been exhausted? And then 
foreseeable consequences? Will the the results be worse than the, uh, uh, the, the existing problem if you go to war about this? These are often the very difficult questions to determine, but at least if we tried to uh, uh, clarify a little in this session, the basic principles that we have to look into as Catholics in order to resolve difficult moral questions, and then hopefully that's been a help for some of the viewers here. I think so, and, and let's, uh, everything you've been describing, you know, look, uh, much of our society is based on Catholic theology. I mean, the whole rules of evidence in court. Uh, and so, uh, of course, we're directing this to our Catholic brothers and sisters, but look, if you're non-Catholic, please take a look at what Father has been describing and talking about. And this is a great, uh, very methodical and deliberate way of determining what is the right answer, right? That's what we all have to do, determine the right answer. And part of that, underlying in that, is being well informed. You have to have the facts. If you don't have the facts, it's impossible to make the right decision. Uh, with regard to this matter, I'll tell you in other jobs I have is uh, in trying to uh, avoid fraud. And one of the telltale signs of someone who's about to perpetrate fraud on you is there is an urgency and there is a dramatic uh, solution. In this case, there is a dramatic solution, which is making an amendment as opposed to the legislature, and uh, it's, it's urgent as well. Legislature can make a decision anytime. So my brothers and sisters, my Catholic and Protestant and everyone else, think about how we Catholics think about making a decision uh, and consult uh, the Vatican II words as well as the catechism. It's okay, you don't have to become Catholic if you read this, these documents, but they're good, they're good, great that's, thinkers. That's, and of course, there's plenty of other, other Christian denominations and, and traditional Jewish, uh, and going right back to Aristotle, there's a whole tradition of, let's say, Judeo-Christian morality sure. that goes into this, that we're, we're, we're basically summarizing here based on biblical principles, going right back to the Old as well as the New Testament, the Ten Commandments. So we have a whole, um, tradition of Judeo-Christian thinking based on the Bible, but in the light also of the great uh, classical philosophy of the great Greek thinkers whose wisdom has been taken up into uh, Catholic and, and other Christian uh, moral traditions as well. So yeah. hopefully so, that's of, of some help to... I think to so, and you know we're coming up in this anniversary uh, think about it. Uh, it, we, it, it and try and use these principles. Uh, it, it'll be intriguing, I think. I think we'll talk about that a lot. Father, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for making this hour so fruitful. Thank you very uh, much, I Peter. think we will be considering these aspects of moral theology and decision-making for a long, long time. So thanks once again for joining us here at St. Joseph Evangelization Network, and come back and see us again.